Nodular fasciitis is classically on the extremity, but sometimes it occurs in the head and neck. And um, it, uh, it can be in younger patients when that happens, like in kids, and it can be a bit more cellular and funny looking and can be down in the muscle. Um, so it's important to know though that nodular fasciitis is well described on the head and neck. A couple of tips and pearls here about nodular fasciitis. They tend to be small. If you see a lesion that you think is nodular fasciitis, but it's bigger than three centimeters, you got to think twice about that. It's not that it couldn't be four centimeters, but it probably can't be, you know, 10 centimeters or anything like that. Um, obviously on the head and neck, usually things are going to get sampled before they get that large, but it's just important to know usually they're small. And even from low power, you can see cystic spaces. Um, nodular fasciitis often has cystic myxoid degeneration. I find that very helpful, incredibly helpful clue that is usually present in most nodular fasciitis. So look for those little myxoid cysts where the, the lesion is breaking down. And they also have this so-called tissue culture arrangement of myofibroblasts. I didn't grow cells in culture anytime during my medical training or undergrad. Maybe you did, but tissue culture doesn't really visually work for me. I think loose and feathery is the terminology I like to use, but whatever visual term works for your brain, that's the term you should use. It doesn't matter what term we say something looks like. It matters that we get the diagnosis right for patient care. So again, look at the myxoid cystic breakdown. It's subtle, but you can see little myxoid bluish pockets that are breaking down and degenerating here. And then these loose feathery areas are so-called tissue culture areas, and other areas will have little short fascicles of myofibroblasts. Some cases like this one are much more pink and have more dense sclerotic collagen. When the lesions are earlier and just starting out, they're much more cellular, then they get cystic breakdown, and then some of them over time get sclerosis and kind of, uh, kind of scar down a little bit almost, if you like to think of it that way. You can still see some of that loose feathery tissue culture area here. Mitoses are often present and can sometimes be abundant, particularly in the more cellular um, early lesions of nodular fasciitis, but you don't want to see hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei. That should really make you think twice about nodular fasciitis. Now here's an example of reactive myofibroblasts in the setting of, uh, this was a, from a melanoma biopsy site. They can look kind of weird, right? The purplish amphiphilic cytoplasm is a helpful clue for myofibroblasts. I have a couple videos on my channel about how to tell myofibroblasts apart from other things. Um, I really recommend for my trainees and, uh, you know, for everyone really who's trying to learn more soft tissue pathology, study post-surgical reactive changes every chance you can get to get an idea of how weird and wild sometimes reactive myofibroblasts can look, okay? I think that anytime you know that something is not going to be tumor, you know it's going to be reactive, study those cells, and then in a hard case where you're not sure if it's a reactive process or a tumor, then you can get a better idea of the range of features. That goes for looking at squamous epithelium, for looking at reactive myofibroblasts, for looking at melanocytes in sun-damaged skin, getting the no getting to feel the range of normal for reactive processes. Um, I mean, that can be really hard. Dr. Weiss at the beginning of my soft tissue fellowship said, one of the main goals of fellowship is for you to be able to sort out neoplastic soft tissue lesions from reactive and you know fasciitis-like lesions because that can be really, really hard. And so this is one way to increase your skills is to study reactive uh, biopsy site and post-surgical changes. Now, what about these wild looking cells? So these big cells are kind of the one exception to the rule there. They're kind of uh, atypical if you like that terminology and you can see them in the setting of a, a background that looks like nodular fasciitis. We've got this loose kind of myxoidy background with extravasated red cells, which some people find very helpful for fasciitis. And we've got these spindle and stellate myofibroblasts, but then we've got these big, huge ganglion looking cells here. So these cells can look pretty scary if you're not familiar with them, but once you know what they are and you see them in the background of what looks like otherwise fasciitis, these are these ganglion-like cells, when they're abundant, you can call this proliferative myositis if it's in the muscle or proliferative fasciitis. I mean, to me, that's just two, two names for the same spectrum of thing. And so basically you have these large ganglion-like cells, but they're in a loose, feathery, um, myxoidy background that looks just like nodular fasciitis. But these can be pretty scary when you see these plus mitoses. And occasionally, especially in kids, you can get a very cellular variant of proliferative myositis where these cells are packed tightly together and those can be quite challenging. And I have certainly struggled with these cases in my own practice. Um, even after doing uh, training in soft tissue pathology and seeing many examples, I still find ones from time to time that give me pause and anxiety before signing them out. 
Uh, what's really helpful is if you see the skeletal muscle fibers suspended in the loose fasciitis background and then the scattered ganglion-like cells. So this pattern of patchy intermingling of splayed apart, sometimes atrophic skeletal muscle with an intervening stuff that looks like fasciitis with all these scattered ganglion-like cells, that to me is very reassuring pattern from low power. This pattern is very reassuring for proliferative myositis. So again, start at the low power. Don't go straight to high power. You're going to freak yourself out when you look at these. And here's another example just to show you. This one was a little more pale because of the scan, but just to know that the mixoid change is sometimes not always as blue as that first example. But again, loose feathery, um, uh, loose feathery myofibroblast, extravasated erythrocytes, which are often present, spindled and stellate or triangle-shaped um, cells.